Phil Zito, episode 447. Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to episode 447 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. Super excited to have you here today. We're going to be going through uh, building automation programming, like I mentioned on our Monday episode. So our Wednesday episodes are going to be more technical in nature. We're going to be looking at what does it actually take to write a program? We're not going to be looking at uploading and downloading programs. Rather, we're going to be looking at sequences of operations. I'm going to talk through design patterns. I'm going to talk through how to kind of chunk out a uh, sequence of operations, how to translate that to a graphical programming interface, all that fun stuff. As always, everything will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 447 after the episode. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified anytime we go live in the future. If you're on LinkedIn or if you're on Facebook, like, comment, and share. That helps spread this. And if you're on iTunes or Spotify listening, you'll definitely want to go to podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 447 afterwards and watch the associated video with this. Uh, that being said, let's dive in. So what I have on my screen here is, uh, I think it's Wisconsin State's uh, general sequences of operations for their controls. I grabbed this because it gives a whole slew of different control sequences. One of the things you're going to find when you start to actually practice programming, which I highly encourage you to do because... Uh, unlike a lot of folks who say it takes years upon years upon years to program, if you have a baseline HVAC sequencing knowledge, you understand some core concepts of HVAC, actually starting to identify the patterns in a program is not terribly difficult. And then it's just a matter of learning the different blocks, because um, we're going to be talking about graphical, not line code programming today. But uh, in the case of graphical, it's about learning the different blocks in your programming environment and how those blocks connect to different sequence chunks. So to give you an idea of what I mean, if we scroll down here, and there's gonna be a lot of scrolling in this, so bear with me because this is a big document at 59 pages. Um, but what I wanna find here, I wanna find Economizer uh, because Economizer is a great one to give an example of actually doing our first controls snippet or controls design pattern. So Economizer should be down here in the air handlers right past laboratory. So bear with me, we're almost there. It's like halfway through. And we'll bring this bad boy up. Come on, we're almost there. I know I could search for economizer, but there's a specific economizer I want. It should be right after discharge air temperature control. There it is. All right. So you're going to see they have a couple different economizers here. You have dry bulb economizer switch, uh, switch over, right? That's a static set point. So let's talk about this because just in this one sentence, there's a lot here. And when I look at new programmers, I tend to find that one of the most difficult things for them to do is simply to go understand what the sequence is saying and actually translate it to code. So the first thing we need to look at here is what are we actually reading? And we have a couple variables in here and we have variables that are logical variables and we have variables that are physical variables. So right off the bat, I see outside air temperature. That is a physical variable. So I like to tend when I read sequences to pick colors. Whatever color works for you. Some of you watching this may be colorblind, so forgive me if I pick a color that doesn't work for you. But for my physical variables, I'm going to pick green. And then for my set points, I'm going to simply pick blue. Actually, blue looks terrible with black background. So we'll pick, uh, we'll pick yellow. Let's see. There we go. All right. I'll turn off highlighter. And what I have right now is I have a physical variable, physical point, and a logical variable. So logical variable, logical point, uh, this is going to be something that doesn't actually exist. 
I can't go out and buy a set point and install it, but I can buy an outside air temperature and install that. And what we notice here is that the economizer sequence shall be enabled. So we're enabling some set of code. And you're going to notice this across most programs. Cooling mode, heating mode, economizer mode, dehumidification, humidification. They all tend to have some sort of enable mode. And they may have multiple variables that enable. Uh, the reason I like to start with economizers is economizer is typically, not always, typically it is a single variable enable, meaning it, in this case specifically, it looks at outside air temperature, that physical point, compares it to this variable, this logical variable, this logical set point of 68 degrees. And then when outside air temp is below that, well, that's when we enable the economizer. And we're going to write this snippet in just a second. A couple things I want to point out, though. This adjustable ADJ, it's pretty standard across the board. Um, whenever I see ADJ, that is a very clear sign that this is a set point and logical variable. So if you see pressure, if you see CFM, if you see temperature, if you see a flow setting, whatever, and it has adjustable after it, that means that that is a variable and most likely a set point. If you don't see adjustable, that does not necessarily mean that that's a physical point. So if I saw 68 degrees and I didn't have adjustable, well, the first thing I would do is I'd send an RFI to make sure that they wanted that to be a read only point, a non-writable logical point, but just in my experience, I would know that that's a logical point. I know it seems like I'm spending a lot of time on this, but these are some core concepts that if you understand are actually going to make writing these programs a lot easier. So we're gonna switch over now to this right here. And uh, I realize that this is small for some of you, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in two fake points. In a real program, you would have a controller, you would map in a physical point, and you would map in a logical point. The physical point you'd have to configure. That's what point-to-point -point calibration is. We'll talk about that in a future episode. For simplicity's sake, I am going to grab two points. This is Niagara. So your mileage may vary. In the case of Niagara, they call analog variables numerics. They call binary variables Boolean. Um, Multi-state are known as enumerations. So we're going to write this program. And I'm going to grab a non-writable numeric point. We're just going to call it OAT. You could tell I used to work at Johnson Controls because I still follow their naming standard. We're going to grab a writable. I'm going to call this, oh, uh, we just call it economizer en, economizer en dash spt, economizer enable set point. Now, you're going to notice a couple things that I'm not going to spend a terrible amount of time on today, uh, which right off the bat, you'll notice this has inputs uh, level 10 and 16. That's a priority array. Uh, that is a, it largely comes from the BACnet world where variables and outputs in BACnet have priority arrays. This allows you to write multiple different command levels. Uh, we'll do an episode on priority arrays in the future, but you'll notice this input does not have a priority array because in theory, there should be an A to D conversion, an analog to digital conversion that actually happens in the field controller where this analog resistive input from the outside air temperature, assuming it's analog resistive and not voltage or uh, milliamps, but assuming it's uh, resistive, it gets converted analog to digital, so it becomes a digital signal. And as such, since the sensor is the only thing writing to that input, um, in some programs, you'll have like relinquish default or you'll have test mode and you can overwrite these things. But for simplicity's sake, um, we're not going to talk about that in this. 
you're going to notice all these variables are zero because I'm writing this offline. So you're going to have to use a little bit of uh, imagination and go with me on this. All right, so I'm going to close out this and I'm going to go to my logic and I am going to grab a less than right here. You could grab a less than or equal to. I tend to like to grab a less than. Some people may grab a hysteresis. That works as well. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. I'm not going to go into his hysteresis, um, which hopefully I'm pronouncing right. But uh, the reason why is because I want to keep this kind of simple so we can paint our concepts here. We're going to look at a bunch of different things through this. But uh, what I do is outside air, right? If this temp, and here's how you read these logic blocks. If outside air is less than economizer set point. So you read it in the order of inputs. If outside air is less than, I'm going to try to zoom in on this a little bit, make it easier for you. If outside air is less than input A, then I should get a Boolean output. That will be my economizer enable. This is called a comparative pattern. It is one of the most common patterns you're going to use in all of programming. And it's important you learn this pattern. I know it seems very simple, but this is the pattern that's typically going to enable your chillers. It's typically going to enable your boilers. It may change to a greater than in the case of a chiller. So let's uh, let me copy this. I'll paste this here. We'll create another one. And I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it here. And we're going to actually call this chiller enable SPT. <clears throat> and I'm going to grab a greater than. And I'm going to drag this over here, greater than. If outside air temp one is greater than, and by the way, you wouldn't do this in programming. You'd use the same outside air. You wouldn't create two physical variables. Uh, you would cr just create the one from the physical point from the controller, and you would map that to all of your logic blocks. But uh, right here, right, I've got outside air temp, outside air temp, so I'm just showing you this for simplicity's sake. If outside air temp is greater than chiller enable set point, then I enable my chiller. And what you'll start to see is you'll start to see a bunch of other things happen. You will go and you'll see uh, on some enables where you might have something like, and I know we're going a little off in the weeds, I promise I'll pull this back. You may have a ISO valve status right and then maybe we also have we'll add another point here chiller or uh yeah we'll call it pump status pmp dash s status and what may happen actually is you may go and now have deeper enable control where you start to add let me go to logic here grab an and I'll say, if I have this enable and I have isolation valve status, then I will actually go and enable my pump, which we'll just call this PMP command. Now, I know I just put a lot in here. And for some of you listening, if you're like, holy crap, he's explaining this very slow, it's because we have a diverse audience and there's a lot to this, and I don't want to go too fast and potentially lose you all. So I'm going to be checking the chat periodically. Definitely go and type any questions you have in the chat. I will try to answer those as I can. But you see, we just kind of expanded this. We said outside air is greater than chiller enable set point. So that's my first variable. And by the way, I like to write this in the order that the sequence reads. So if I had a sequence chunk, just visualize this, and it said chiller enable sequence, and it said first outside air 
is greater than chiller enable set point. And then it says isolation valve status is on, then turn on pump. So I would write it in that order. I want to write it in the order that the person coming after me, if they read the sequence and they look at my code, they're going to see it in that order so they can read the sequence and they can check a box when they're trying to troubleshoot something. But I can see right here, all right, outside air temp is greater than chiller enable set point and my isolation valve status is open. I know we don't have the ISO valve command on here. Don't worry about that. And if these are true, so this is what's called Boolean logic, which is something you need to know if you, and we'll do an episode on that in the future, by the way. Uh, if you don't know Boolean logic, programming is going to be very painful for you. Boolean logic is something like if I have input A and input B and they're both true, then I output a true. An OR block, which if I go to logic here, and grab an OR block, this would say, if I have you know, our outdoor air enable and our ISO valve status, if they were going to this, if either of those are true, my output would be true. And then from the Boolean output, you'll go and you will write to your pump command. Very, very basic snippet of code, but we're putting a lot of concepts in here. And what you'll see as you get into programming, there will be timer delays. You'll have maybe an on delay timer to give the pump time to open up and start running and pushing water and to hit its status switch. You may have time delays for the ISO valve to open up. If you're doing economizer, um, you may have time for that to open up. There's a variety of things you may see, but all of this kind of comes together. So I'm going to pull us off of this and I'm going to go back to the sequence real quick. And I'm going to zoom in on this right here. So we see floating dry bulb economizer switchover. This is where, right, the economizer sequence shall be enabled whenever the outside air temperature is more than four degrees adjustable, cooler than the return air temperature. Okay, so let's take that and let's write that sequence. I'm going to give you all a second to look at that while I delete this. And I'm going to write this in a very, very, very simple way. Um, so what we have here, floating dry bulb economizer switch over. Let me highlight it. Okay. When outside air temp, when we set our physical variables are green. So I'm going to go and uh, let me make sure I'm sharing that. Okay, good. Let me highlight this to green is more than four degrees adjustable. So there's our logical variable. Then the return air temperature, green variable. So now we know we have two physical inputs and one logical variable. So let's switch over to programming and we are going to take this guy right here, our writable set point. I'm gonna delete this right here. I just gotta click control delete. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to grab my new point and we're going to call this RA-T. So return air temperature plus this adjustable set point. So I'm going to go in here and find math and I'm going to grab an add function. Now you could do this other ways. I know some of you watching this are like, why don't you use this block? Why don't you use that block? There are definitely other ways to do this. I completely agree with you on that. But here we go. So we said if outside air temp, right? If I bring back up the sequence is more than four degrees cooler, right? I don't like this, by the way, if you write sequences, I hope you see the problem here, right? Outside air is more than four degrees cooler than the return air temperature, right? You could just say when the outside air temp is yeah that's a tough one how would you i you know what how would you all reword this in the chat write in the chat how you think you would reword this does this read simply to you do you feel like this is easy to understand or do you feel like the person writing this program could potentially get mixed up let me know in the chat i'd be more than happy to 
kind of see your explanation. But uh, what I would typically say, right, is the return air temperature is more than four degrees, is, is more than four degrees above the outside air temperature. When outside air is greater than four degrees below return air temperature, that reads a lot better. Matt, yeah, you're absolutely right. I like that. That definitely seems a lot more, a lot less confusing. Those are things that you need to consider if you're on the engineering side of things and you're actually writing these sequences out for people. Who's reading this? What is their reading level? Is this going to be confusing? But let's go back to our program. So we know outside air temp, right, is less than return air temp plus that. But if we read the sequence, I just want to double check because even this little snippet's throwing me whenever outside air is more than four degrees cooler. Okay, so outside air is more than four degrees cooler. So outside air is less than, I think we're going to actually have to say, Fuck, man, that sequence, I didn't get good sleep last night, and that thing's even throwing me for a loop. If outside air is and return air temp plus four, right? So if outside air is more than four degrees. Yeah, I've got it written right. Okay. See, that thing throws me, and I've been programming for the better part of... Uh, 17 years. Holy crap. 17 years. Yeah. I've been writing programs for the better part of 17 years. And even that I have to like read it and think about it and really consider what the heck does that mean? But this will give us that. And you can see I've got my adjustable, right? So four degrees adjustable. And then you can actually go in and you can set in the case of Niagara, they call it a fallback variable, but you can set a default value for it. So we'll go back here. It's not going to show up because, like I said, this is not a live program. Any questions so far? Does anyone disagree on how I wrote this? Anyone have a, a different way? I realize it's, it's a little flashy. I don't know why. Oh, I see why it's flashy, I think. Hold on. There we go. Now it shouldn't be flashy. I had it overlapping on this, and so that was making the screen flash. All right, let's go back to our sequence. Let's keep continuing with this. Okay, let's find something a little more complicated. I don't want to do free stats. I want to go up. And let's look for some sort of control of a coil. Discharge air temp set point shall be 55 degrees. Okay, that's great. But how do we actually? The heating mixed air dampers and the cooling coil shall be controlled in sequence to maintain the discharge air temperature. So what I like to start doing whenever I see a big chunk of programming is I like to actually start breaking things up. So you don't have to go and have everything in a big chunk. All right, so we're gonna kinda just keep breaking this up here. And we're gonna say discharge air temperature control, the heating coil, so that's a physical point. Mixed air dampers, it's a physical point. And cooling coil, that's a physical point. Sh to maintain the discharge air set point temperature. This is an interesting one. This is a physical point and a logical point. So whenever I get a physical and a logical, I make it blue. Like I said, the text doesn't show up great here, so I'm going to make this text white. There we go. At no point shall the heating coil be operating when the mixed air dampers are economizing or the chilled water valve is open. So we got a lot of programming to write here but you can start to see where that AND block came into place because what I would do is I would say heating coil enable and an economizer enable are not enabled 
in order for my chilled water to go and run and then vice versa. Whenever discharge air temperature is above the set point, we shall follow the sequence. So we've got our first thing to do here, right? We've got to go and grab our numeric point, DA-T, and our numeric writable, DAT-SPT. Uh, okay, so discharge air temp and our set point. And let me throw that on the screen right here. And then let me go back here whenever discharge air temperature is above the set point. Okay, so that is when we're gonna run our start of our sequence. So whenever discharge air is, what is what? You all should be saying greater than. Whenever discharge air is greater than set point, then we run our sequence. What is our sequence? Okay, heating coil shall be modulated closed as sequenced below. Okay, so we're gonna close at, I am going to, here we go, divide this, divide this. Give me a second while I clean this up and just make it easier to read. Okay. And here we go. Okay. <clears throat> heating coil shall be modulated closed as blow when heating is completely off and the economizer sequence is enabled. The economizer outdoor air damper shall be modulated sequentially, blah, 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 to maintain DAT set point. Provide an offset set point for adjusting the outside sequential control. I really do not like the sequence discharge error here we go when heating is off and economizer sequence so we need to add our economizer sequence we're going to just use a basic outside air sequence we're going to go to this real quick numeric point oat oa-t all right, we're gonna grab our numeric writable, OAT-EN, or EN-SPT. So if outside air is less than, right, that was the chunk for economizer, let me see. Let's go back here. Economizer outside air is below 68. Okay, good. Let's go back up to this bad boy. Let's go here. So we got to grab a less than. Outside air is less than set point. Let's go back to our program. Let's take a look at this guy. When heating is completely off and economizer sequence is enabled, the economizer damper shall be modulated sequentially. Da, 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 to maintain the discharge air temperature set point. So I'm going to grab two points that I have not created yet. So just go with me on this. But uh, we're going to create a Boolean writable here. We're going to call it heating enable. And we're going to have a point here. We're going to call this cooling enable. And these would be created by the heating enable and cooling enable set points. I'm gonna go to my and block here. I'm actually pin slots. I'm gonna add a third variable here. So outside air, so economizer, that's true. And then both of these should be false. So I'm gonna not these, not, and not this one as well. Input, input. What a not does is it reverses the Boolean value. So once again, we want to write this in a way, and here we go. Let me show it on the screen. Sorry about that. I'm running a bunch of screens. So if I don't flip, just remind me. 
But uh, outside air temp, less than, going into our AND block, this AND block, right? I clicked pin slots to add the third input to the AND. I added a heating enable and a cooling enable Boolean writable that this is going to get its value from the heating enable sequence and the cooling enable sequence. I'm nodding this, which this allows us to read the sequence when heating is off and the economizer is enabled and the mechanical cooling, which it doesn't say here, but it does say actually on the previous page. When both of these are not true, then I have economizer mode. So outside air, enabling economizer, heating is not on, mechanical heating, mechanical cooling is not on. All of these are true. That gives me economizer enable control. Now let's take a look at what economizer enable control is. I've not read this prior to doing this episode, so I'm not 100% sure how they expect us to do this. Provide an adjustable set point for adjusting outside air sequential. When the offset set point is at 100%, the outside air damper shall be fully open. What? Before the return air damper. What a weird sequence. When the offset set point is at 50, the outside air damper shall be 50. When the offset set point is zero, any percent, when the outside air is completely open, the return air damper should be completely closed or the economizer sequence is not enabled. Okay, the chilled water valve shall modulate to maintain. So when the outside air damper is completely open, and the return air damper is completely closed, or the economizer sequence is enabled, this does not seem efficient. Does this seem efficient to any of you all? Am I just uh, missing something here? It's just, I would not do this sequence, but that's just me. Especially this coming out of Wisconsin, that's just, I don't know, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, the chilled water valve shall modulate open to maintain the discharge air set point. Discharge air set point is below set point. The reverse shall include uh, occur. Cooling coil shall be locked out below 50 degrees outside air temperature. Okay, that's fine, but why would we not? I guess the outside air enable is our economizer lockout. So in theory, we shouldn't go below 68 degrees with the economizer open. But then why? I don't know why this line right here would exist. Because when I read this, and we're totally going off on a tangent here, but uh, when I read this right here and I look at this, I'm like, okay, the outside air economizer is open and the return air damper is closed, but outside air should only be enabled above 68 degrees or below 68 degrees. So... Are you saying we're going to try to use free cooling first? And then if it doesn't work, we're going to use the chilled water valve? I guess. I guess that's what they're saying. So that's what we will do. I'm not going to even try to demonstrate this goofy stuff right here because I think that'll really confuse some of the newer people in here. Let me bring this up. So we have this economizer is open, return air damper is closed. And we're going to drive to set points. So we're actually going to have two PID loops. Now we're introducing a new concept. So this is going to be my economizer enable. And it's less than, there should be an economizer lockout though, but I don't see that in the sequence. I could have just missed it. So I'm going to grab in Niagara what is called a loop point. This is also known as a PID. I'm going to enable this economizer PID. I'm going to throw it in here. And we're going to come up and we're going to grab two variables, DAT and DAT step point. I'm actually going to pin some slots here. I'm going to grab a loop enable, a control variable, and a set point. So um, this, it's economizer, so... If this charge air is above set point, I want to open the economizer more. So it's a direct acting loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab DAT. I'm first going to grab this economizer enable, and I'm going to have it go to loop enable. That's going to enable my economizer. 
Then I'm going to grab discharge air temperature. That's going to be my controlled variable. That's the physical point that the PID loop is trying to control. And I'm going to grab my set point. A PID loop is a way, it's proportional integral derivative. You have a proportional difference between the set point and the variable, or the variable in the set point. The controlled variable is the physical point you're trying to control to typically, and the uh, set point is the logical set point you're using. Now, the difference between those two is known as error, and you have a proportional response to the error. So if I set a proportional value of 10, right? Then I should get 10% output for every um, point of error. So if I have 10 points of error, I should have 100% output. Um, most common when something's done wrong is actually getting the proportional um, value wrong, the P-band wrong, which we'll talk about in a future episode. Then you have integral, which is how long has this error existed? That is an upward pressure. And you have derivative, which is also how long has this error existed? And that's a downward pressure. We very often do not use derivative, except for in very tight process control scenarios. But so this economizer PID, right, it is going to write to our physical points, which would be a econ o and a r a d o so i would do this i would write to the economizer and i'd write to it at priority 16 and i want to actually inverse do i want to teach you all inversing I mean, we could use a, typically what will happen is some sort of reset. So input right here, your low limit, your high limit, your um, output, low limit, high limit, and what you're going to do with a reset, or in some cases, it's going to be called a span, is that is going to allow me to say that this output at zero is actually 100, and this output of this PID at 100 is actually zero. And the reason you're gonna do that reset is you're gonna want to have the economizer controlling one way and the return air damper controlling the inverse, so they should be opposite of one another. Another way of doing this, by the way, is that you can go and simply have the economizer um, rotate clockwise on zero to 10 volt signal and the return air damper counterclockwise. So you can actually set that up physically. Uh, I prefer not to do that. I prefer to have them both do the exact same thing and do it in logic. Um, that way it's just a little bit easier for the person in the field, but your mileage will vary. So you would set up that reset, which I'm not really gonna configure for the setup sick of time because we are already at what how far 40 minutes into this so i'm going to be wrapping this pretty soon but uh i'm just going to go here pin a slot real quick input a output into input a output into input 16 and this would be our very very simple pid pattern so you've seen two things right now you've seen a comparative pattern and a PID pattern. I haven't shown you, you know, uh, integrated patterns where like you integrate a status to a pattern. Um, so an on delay or an off delay pattern, things of that nature. I haven't shown you lead lag patterns. I think we'll do that in a future episode. But I think at this point, we've covered a lot of key concepts that I'm going to recap on. First, we've covered how to go and actually read a sequence. We've talked about on a sequence, you want to go and first identify the physical variable and you want to identify the logical variable. You want to write your program in order to the sequence. We want to identify things that are adjustable versus things that are not adjustable. We also want to go and understand any interlocks that may be in play and then account for those, as I mentioned, by using and 
or 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 exclusive or things of that nature. So Boolean logic, which we'll cover in a future episode. And we want to make sure that we utilize nots in the case of this interlock logic right here. And we want to make sure that we have our PID pattern properly set up with a loop enable. Um, I'm very big advocate of not having loops enabled constantly. I'm a big advocate of having a loop, a PID loop uh, enabled if your control software allows you to based on what the actual enable mode is. And then having you know, your controlled variable and your set point tied to things. And you can see actually, if I go in here, kind of how this all comes together. What I've done is I built a schedule and I've actually built some folders here with uh, this one is fan command. This one is cooling command. And you're gonna see I built kind of outside air temp, which is enabling cooling. And then I've got a fan status and I've got a cooling temp enable. And then I've got my PID loop down here and I've got my cooling and my effective set point. I've got a low temp mode that I've actually put in here based on a switch that switches uh, this cooling valve to a certain position based on that. So you see how it all starts to come together. I'm going to. Um, programming. Oh, shit. You lost me because I turned myself off. All right. Like I was saying, I, I sometimes I forget if I take my face off the screen, you stop hearing my voice. So um, what I was saying while well, you lost me for that couple seconds is uh, I hope that this helped you all out. This is the point we're going to kind of stop for today. Uh, I know it was pretty basic for some of you. Uh, for the rest of you, this may have been something brand new to you. At the end of the day, I hope you're starting to see how certain parts of the sequence of operation will correlate to certain logical blocks and patterns. That's kind of the biggest aha that you need to make first when you're starting to learn programming. Once you start to identify the sequence chunks that tie to patterns, then you start to identify what logic blocks enable you to do those sequence chunks then you're really able to go and start writing programs pretty easily. Um, there's nothing really new under the sun. Pretty much every sequence that has been done has been written. I mean, some of the guideline 36 stuff can get complicated. Some of the really complex chiller plants can get complicated, especially if you have partial loads that need to be handled um, during non-mechanical cooling conditions that can become complicated. That being said, I'm going to pause, see if there's any questions on anywhere so far today. Um, it looks like none on there. I'm not seeing anything on LinkedIn, so we should be good there. I do hope that you all found some value out of this. I hope that this really opened your eyes as far as how programming works some basic approaches to it. We'll look at more complex things in the future. We'll definitely dive into priority arrays. We'll definitely start to explore some more complex sequences. We'll talk about some other patterns in the future as well. Definitely let me know in the chat, whether you're listening to this live or after the fact, what you would like to see on the podcast moving forward. I think in next week's episode, it'd be a good time to explore priority arrays, how they work, relinquish defaults, things of that nature, and the difference between variables. Um, maybe even look at some BTL listings, understand what BACnet really is, what BACnet objects are, what BACnet properties are, what BACnet services are. I find that BACnet is a really misunderstood protocol, and it like it or not, it's the protocol that we use for building automation, at least until something else comes out, which I don't foresee happening anytime soon. Uh, thank you all for being here. If you feel like we've earned it, definitely go leave us a five-star review on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, also, for those of you who uh, are looking to kind of get more of this info, Definitely subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, follow our LinkedIn channel as well. That's where we do these episodes. If you're wondering where you sit at from a skill perspective, 
um, I really encourage you to go and to check out this link right here, which uh, I'm going to show you. Let me go to this tab right here and share this with you. This is, uh, yep, there we go. This is our skill assessment. It's completely free. Smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash skills. If you wonder where you're at, what your skill ability is, it's an online assessment that I really encourage you to put yourself or your team through. Figure out your skill gap so you can figure out what you need to start focusing on from a training perspective. Thank you all for being here. I will pause to see if there's any more questions, but um, yeah, it was a good Wednesday. Uh, fortunately, we made it up. I wasn't sure if we were. We got dumped on from a snow perspective last night. We're supposed to have no snow and uh, got several inches and we live on the top of a hill on top of a hill on top of a hill. So it was a little sketchy if we were going to get up, but we did. Um, I'm a little tired because we had to stay down in Phoenix last night. We had a big customer dinner and uh, wasn't about to try to drive up at 11 o'clock at night back up north to northern Arizona. So uh, definitely went and uh, slept in a hotel bed, which was not very comfortable. So if I seem a little more tired than normal, that's why. I do appreciate you all being here. I'm not seeing any questions. Definitely let us know what you'd like to see in the future. You all will guide what we cover in the future. So I really encourage you to let us know. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate all of you. And you all have an awesome day. This will be up at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 447 within the next hour or two. Thanks so much, everybody. And have an awesome rest of your week. Take care.